they've done on the border. Well, a heck of a morning here in America's newsroom. <laughs> that was the president just a few officially declaring a national emergency to secure funding for the border wall. Yeah, we've been watching this debate now play out for some time now. I guess really you go back three years, right, when the candidacy first began. Uh, but the government shut down. That lasted for 35 days. We're not going to revisit that. The spending bill was signed uh, by co passed by Congress yesterday. The president indicates that he'll sign that now. Um, and then we'll see, you know, the next wrinkle in the story. But it looks like more money can go to border security, while the rest of it's going to be tied up before a judge of some sort very soon. That was quite a morning. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. It's Friday, by the way. Happy yeah, weekend right. to you, Bill <laughs> Hemmer. Enjoy you. it, everybody. As Thanks well. for joining us here at America's News. And we'll see you back here Monday morning, 9 to noon. Outnumbered starts right now. Fox News alert, new reaction pouring in after President Trump declares a national emergency to secure funds to build a border wall, and Democrats are promising a fight. The president announcing his decision from the Rose Garden of the White House. He will sign a bipartisan compromise bill to secure, border, to secure the border and fund the government, but also says he must go even further. This is Outnumbered, and I'm Melissa Francis. Here today is the host of the Evening Edit on the Fox Business Network, Elizabeth McDonald, Fox News contributor Lisa Booth, Fox News contributor Jessica Charlov, and joining us on the couch, co-host of Fox & Friends, Fox News radio host, and host of What Makes America Great on the Fox Nation app, Brian Kilmeade, there was a lot more to your introduction, but I cut yeah, it off. Yeah, because we have to get, we, we have to get to the topic. Eight hours of radio. <laughs> yeah, right. not enough time. We can't forget the radio show. <laughs> All right, let's get right to it. The White House releasing this picture of President Trump signing the National Emergency Declaration today. The president using his ex executive powers to obtain billions for construction of a border wall, calling it an urgent problem that needs to finally be addressed. The top Democratic leaders in Congress releasing a statement calling this a, quote, power grab and vowing to fight it in the courts. The move will allow the president to continue to fight for the wall while averting another partial government shutdown that would have been triggered at midnight tonight. Watch this. We're going to be signing today and registering national emergency because we have an invasion of drugs invasion of gangs invasion of people and it's unacceptable and by signing the national emergency something signed many times by other presidents nobody's done the job that we've ever done i mean nobody's done the job that we've done on the border a fox news poll finding 56 percent opposed president trump bypassing congress and declaring an emergency to build the wall with 38% in favor. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live on Capitol Hill with the latest Mike. Melissa, good afternoon. White House officials tell Fox News here is how they intend to round up money to build President Trump's border barricade. $1.375 billion in the appropriations bill that Congress just passed. $600 million for the Treasury Department forfeiture fund. $2.5 billion from the De Defense Department in terms of reprogramming and $3.5 billion from the military construction budget. President Trump says he recognizes this action will get tied up in the courts. We'll have a national emergency, and we will then be sued, and they will sue us in the Ninth Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there, and we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake and we'll win in the Supreme Court. Just like the ban, they sued us in the Ninth Circuit and we lost and then we lost in the appellate division. And then we went to the Supreme Court and we won. A Republican senator who helped negotiate the appropriations package isn't sold on this maneuver. I've been very clear on my concerns about the president declaring this as an emergency in ways that haven't been done before, uh, and that's still my view, but let's see exactly what he tries to do and how he tries to do it, and then we'll see where we go from there. But Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he will support this national emergency, and some of President Trump's closest allies here, like South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, says he understands the president's frustration. We had these three weeks to see if we could find a compromise. My hope was that we could give the president his budget number and do something about TPS and DACA. And that ship never appeared. And that was very disappointing. 
So uh, if you can send troops to the border, which uh, Obama did, Bush did, Trump's done, why can't they erect barriers while they're there? I think he has all the legal authority in the world to do this, and I will stand behind it. Others suggest lawmakers will regret this precedent. This is, no one is putting this uh, in the column of, of uh, national emergencies. And if that were to happen, it would be, I think, a very serious mistake. It would be opening the doors for future presidents to come in and willy-nilly declare national emergencies just because their priority project uh, was not approved. In fact, some suggest a future Democratic president could declare a national emergency on health care, climate change, or gun violence. Melissa? All right, Mike Emanuel, thank you so much for that. Brian, I want to start with you, to, because to be clear, the White House laid out these various pots of money that they're looking to for the wall. There's the uh, $1.375 billion from this deal, which has a lot of handcuffs on it. Um, there's $2.5 billion from the Pentagon's Drug Interdiction Initiative, $600 million from the Treasury Drug Forfeiture Program. It is only that $3.5 billion from the Pentagon's Military Construction Fund. That's the only piece of this, uh, up to eight, I think is the total. That's the only piece that comes from declaring this national emergency. Was it necessary? Well, they were putting this all together for the last three months. They didn't know what was going to happen, but you have to understand one thing. The president's not just trying to fulfill a campaign promise. He actually believes it is an emergency. He could put uh, sodium pentothal, give him that. He'd say the same thing. Put him a lie detector test, it would come out the same way. So he, fulfill, he thoroughly believes it. And he go, deals with law enforcement in coming to that conclusion. If you've seen the quotes over the last, and the uh, sound bites over the last few days, is these people are saying they don't care about politics. They're saying we need help. We don't have enough money, and we've got to get people for Border Patrol. We need the barrier. It absolutely is effective. And the reason why more... Uh, uh, drug comes through the ports is because that's where they have the most sensors and monitors. That's why they're picking up most of it. So to me, uh, there's been 58 times this has been used for pride presidents since uh, Jimmy Carter. This is a time in which, yeah, we're going to test uh, the limitations of the power of the president. Yeah. I can understand the reservations. The one thing they told me is the gun analogy doesn't work because this is a, that's a Second Amendment. That's a, that's a right. Okay. But when you talk about other areas, maybe down the pike, they'll be declared emergency. Maybe if they are an emergency, they should be declared this way because Congress can't do anything effectively. Emac, here's the other side. So um, in the other cases where you declared emergency, you weren't reappropriating funds from somewhere else, mm -hmm. that this does violate the Constitution because Congress has the power of the purse. The president does not. That's the argument. Yeah, that's a, that is the argument. That's why five Republicans oppose it, including Susan Collins, I think Tom Tillis, and uh, Marco Rubio. Well, here's the thing. 1993, SCOTUS decision said, yes, the president has a statutory authority to do this, to use reprogrammed money. Uh, you see it in the 76 Emergencies Act. It says, you know, he can, he does have the power without regard to any other provision to do this. It's, and the GAO supports this. Uh, the 2006 Secure Fence Act supports it. There's language existing that he can do this. Uh, you know, we, we had Re Representative Mo Brooks saying, how many more dead Americans do you need for this uh, to be declared a national emergency? Absolutely. We had it for swine flu, Sierra Leone diamonds. We know that President Obama uh, got money for insurers for Obamacare. So, you know, it was sued and lost. This will be a war of attrition in the courts, though. You could see that happening. And maybe the, it was too broad and deferential, the 76 Emergencies Act uh, mm -hmm. for the president's power. But, you know, so the, the, the issue remains, is it a crisis? Yes. Are people being harmed by it? Are Americans being harmed by it? Yes. So I think that's where the focus of the argument should the, go. The president denies that this is creating a precedent. Let's listen to his words. And Jessica, I'll get your, your response. Go ahead. And the people that say we create precedent, well, what do you have, 56 or a lot of times? Well, that's creating precedent. And many of those are far less important than having a border. You don't have a border. You don't have a country. It, it, Lindsey Graham made the point, too, that Democrats could have made a deal if they wanted to trade for DACA. And it is has been interesting to me in the past couple of weeks. You haven't heard Democrats say word one about helping people who are trying to get permanent status here. They could have traded for that. 
That's because they believe that they can get a clean bill there. And Nancy Pelosi has said that since the beginning, that she wants a clean bill for DREAMers here, and that we're going to be looking at comprehensive immigration reform. You hear the new candidates for president talking about that, like Amy Klobuchar did with Brett Baer. I think there's a distinction to be made here between an emergency and having a wall. And there are border agents and people who work down there who certainly say that a border wall would help us. There are also people like Congressman Will Hurd, who represents 42 percent of the space there, who says we don't need a wall. And what the president is doing is transferring the language to emergency, which may just be, I believe in this thing. And I agree with you, Brian. He believes in his heart that this is true. But for you to say that you've been, he's been president over two years now, he had control of both houses and didn't get anything done for this wall that he has been saying has been an today. emergency since the beginning, since he came down that golden escalator and changed all of our lives, seems ridiculous and patently false. Well, if it's an emergency, it should have been declared an emergency years ago. The numbers have not changed. Actually, when you look at the statistics going back over the last 20 years, our, our situation with illegal immigration has actually gotten dramatically better. If you were to say that, to an, angel, were to say that to an, an angel family, they would say, yeah, it's a crisis. Well, it's, it's I, a I, I, I would understand like to, that, but I wanna, I wanna tragedy get in here. does not mean that you circumvent the Constitution and you set a precedent. I don't know what a crisis is then. Well, okay. just here's the thing. A, a clean deal for DACA would be insanity because you're just encouraging and incentivizing illegal activity, further illegal activity on the southern it's border. The so that, kids that, are that is a non-starter and is just a, a not a, a. It's kind of a dumb idea, just to be honest. Uh, oh, second deal. Secondly, we had four. No, I mean, I love you. Nancy that Pelosi. was Nancy Pelosi, well, not you. I'm a on her have, behalf. Oh, stop! But you have 400,000 people that were apprehended along the southern border last year. I think it is fair to say that there is a crisis here in dealing with activity on the southern border. I worry for the president from a political standpoint because I think that he actually has is on solid footing when he talks about law and order. And I think the conversation around immigration over the past few weeks has been illuminating in the sense that you've had Democrats just embrace lawlessness. You have Democrats that brought illegal immigrants to the State of the Union. You have Democrats like Senator Bob Menendez saying that it is not criminal to cross the border undocumented. Of course it is. You have Democrats that wanted to get rid or reduce the numbers of detention beds, forcing ICE to release criminal aliens uh, in this country and not be able to apprehend them. So Democrats have embraced lawlessness in this country and that's a strong argument okay. for president trump but now the focus is going to be on the wall as opposed to him being able to strongly make that argument and make it clear brian let me ask you because andy mccarthy was on a short time ago making the point that um you know president obama when he was looking for the money um to put on the pallets to give to the iranians he actually pulled 1.7 billion dollars from the judgment fund and that there were quieter ways to go around to go around what was happening with congress and find your money for this without declaring a national emergency and, hmm. you know, begging the courts to stop you, that he could have done what President Obama did to get money when he couldn't get it out of Congress. What do you think of that? Well, uh, that's a very sophisticated, subtle way of doing things. I don't know if you noticed, this president doesn't really do, do subtle well. No. And he yeah. also doesn't want to have, to have someone accusing him. What were you doing, Adam Schiff? What were you doing when you took that money and repurposed it? Why didn't you tell anybody? Instead, he's like, hey, by the way, I'm going to need that money, and here's where I'm taking it, and these are the people that I've dealt with. I would say this. All they had to do was be more reasonable in the negotiation, and there wouldn't be any need for this. But to give them 1.3 and to have all these tags to it, can't do it in Roma, can't put it in a Rio Grande City. Uh, the census, they, they couldn't go into Salino, Texas. They got to deal with the individual mayors. You can't put a fence near the National Butterfly Park, the Low Lomita Historical Park. He's looking at this, goes, it only can go in one direction, one way, and I got to get permission from all these mayors? So this but, is not a legitimate but don't, don't negotiation. Don't you think that that's what Democrats wanted, though. They were antagonizing him into making this move so that it know. could be challenged. Know. Do you think they were thinking but that far ahead? But doesn't it also matter what that means? And Republicans created this as well, that you have three co-equal branches of government. This president is not a despot. He's not an autocrat. He has to work with Congress. That's how, that's why we send these people to Washington to I, act I as a you. check on but him. Do, but do you so understand? that's what he gets. Well, where what happens as part of the negotiation is saying, okay, is that what you're going to do? This is what I'm going to do. Uh, for 35 days, Nancy Pelosi wouldn't even negotiate. That was her choice. No one thought she would but negotiate Trump at all. But Chuck Schumer gave him 1.6 million. Oh, where where, where, where were the Democrats, so, is there are cities, in, sorry, there are cities in Mexico that have higher homicide rates per capita than in the Middle East. 
least. They don't care about butterflies. Yeah. Okay. And first of all, Democrats were silent when President Obama moved forward things with DACA, which he had said repeatedly he didn't have the authority to do. So Democrats really don't have a place to speak from here. And what I meant earlier is President Trump is much stronger talking about law and order as opposed to talking about this national emergency declaration because the waters are muddied there in the sense that not all Republicans are with him on it. Independents might not be, and Democrats sure, surely aren't. So. And ironically, when the president was a private citizen, he tweeted how President right. Obama had overstepped his authority there with the executive order. So now he probably there's sees always a tweet. How what, for for everybody? Well, yeah, yeah. 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 Mike Pence too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, new fallout over former acting FBI director Andrew McCabe claiming in an interview that DOJ officials were serious, not sarcastic, when they discussed possibly removing President Trump from office. Now lawmakers want McCabe to testify what it says about the department's action towards the president. Plus, Democrats divided as Amazon scraps plans to build a New York City headquarters. Some angry at the loss of thousands of new high-paying jobs, but Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and 2020 candidate Elizabeth Warren are celebrating those Yay. lost jobs, while local business owners are left to pick up the pieces. Go down to the actual site and see what basically we're left with now. Look, I mean, just turn your cameras that way to the Ryder truck parking lot, the bombed out cars in our neighborhood. This is not Shangri-La over here. We needed this over here. We needed this. I was flabbergasted. I said, you know, why on earth, after all the effort that we all have put in, would you simply walk away? You know, it's clear they made up their mind on their own. And if that's the way they thought they could be a part of our community, it probably wasn't going to work out anyway. If they thought they could just be an island and not a part of our city. Yeah, good luck with the lost tax revenue. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio blasting Amazon for canceling plans to build a second headquarters in New York City with as many as 25,000 new jobs. Goodbye. The plan drew local opposition over billions in tax incentives for Amazon. Now Democrats are deeply divided over the deal's collapse. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo blaming Democratic-controlled state Senate, writing, quote, a small group of politicians put their own narrow polit political interests above their community, the state's economic future, and the best interests of the people in their state. The New York State Senate has done tremendous damage, and they should be held accountable for this lost economic opportunity. But Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeting, anything is possible. <laughs> Today was the day a group of dedicated, everyday New Yorkers, well, politicians, but, and their neighbors defeated Amazon's corporate greed, its worker exploitation, and the power of the richest man in the world. And 2020 hopeful Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeting, Amazon, one of the wealthiest companies on the planet, just walked away from billions of taxpayer bribes all because some elected officials in New York aren't sucking up to them enough. How long will we allow giant corporations to hold our democracy hostage? But some local business owners are not so happy. Take a look. It's for business in Queens, everybody. We're closed for business here. Don't bring your big business here, because if you're too big, you get the ire of uh, office seekers. I know two days before the deal, there was an announcement that we'd get new sewers, subways, sounded good. Um, so without Amazon, I'm hoping the city still follows through on their promises. Yeah, right. Uh, e e Mac, I, 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 I got I to gotta start with you because you're my business lady <laughs> over you. here. Um, so Amazon, we all buy stuff from Amazon. They make a whole bunch of money. Right. They're opening, you know, creating all these jobs here. So the local government wants to take the money that they've mm -hmm. made in the form of taxes. Mm -hmm. um, they let them keep it as an incentive to come here. But then these other politicians are mad because they were counting on that money from Amazon for all their little projects all over the place and all the other stuff. So they punish local New Yorkers by taking away 25,000 good jobs because they weren't going to get that tax yeah, revenue. That's right. Amazon was going to get to keep their hard-earned money. Right. Where I am I going wrong? You're not, you nailed every point. You, you're on it. Um, I understand the corporate welfare debate. However, 230 cities are also bidding, saying, here, come to us, Amazon. We'll give you tax breaks. New York City was built on tax breaks. Uh, and your point's well taken. It, it, was, uh, it was, as you've noted, it wasn't a $3 billion cash pile as Alexandria Cortez. By the way, critics are saying she won 16,000 votes and she's trying to up in the economy. There wasn't a pile of cash that Amazon was taking. It was over a 10-year period that they would get the breaks if they hit job targets. And to Melissa's point, 
Those 25,000 jobs could have been $3.75 billion in annual salaries. People paying income taxes, those workers, corporate taxes for the different Amazon uh, aff affiliates, and sales taxes, and so local property taxes. So the estimated boon for the progressive wish list uh, in revenue coming in, 27 billion was the estimate that it could have come in uh, for the three billion down payment over 10 years uh, for a tax break. So that's the math. Doesn't it make more sense if you want to create a level playing field and you're saying Amazon, it's not fair that they're getting tax breaks and the local businesses aren't? I hear that point and that makes sense. Isn't the answer, though, to lower taxes on the other businesses rather than either kicking Amazon right. out or... Well, I mean, that's the same thing Governor Cuomo is saying with the new tax rules. Why, why, the, uh, why the blue cities paying such a price because they have such high taxes. But just judging by this, let's leave the tax system way it is. Uh, the liberal governor, mayor of New York and the liberal governor of New York combined to lure Amazon to New York City, Long Island City specifically, and they beat out 200 cities. To get a number one draft pick, to get LeBron James or to get Mike <laughs> Trout, you have to bring in and make it incentive, incentives because they're rare talents. Amazon is a, is a company that is as good as any in the country, a great story. They were going to get $8 million uh, worth of square feet of uh, uh, in Long Island City, they were going to pay for. They were going to revamp. They were going to give Plaxall about uh, to pay two hundred ninety-five thousand dollars per square foot to take over their plant. They were going to bring in countless jobs that the average pay between one hundred fifty and one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. It's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Amazon's going to grow. It would be an attraction for everyone to come. You have to do a lot to get a lot. This was an investment, which just shows you if the Democratic Party <laughs> wants to live off this investment, this is part of that socialist attitude. I hate rich, successful people. I hate big, successful businesses. If that's what they're going to run on, they're in a lot they of trouble. They have no tax revenue. They're, they now have no tax revenue to fund all of these, the Green New Deal and the this and everything you want to do. Well, and Cuomo already announced a budget shortfall, and we have rich yep. people fleeing the city of New York because of the high cost of living and also taxes here. I know, you know, the taxes are abysmal living in New York City. I can attest for moving here. But it's funny because Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, tweeted out and he said, look, the left is basically uh, this is what you get when you push socialism, when you're hostile to business. And then he reminded everyone that Texas is number one for business, uh, trying to send that message out. So funny for him to get on this. But I, I think it's becoming increasingly clear, and I'd love to get Jess's opinion on this, that the Democrat Party is beholden to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because she was the one that was leading the charge on this. You look at the Green Deal and look at how many 2020 presidential contenders signed up for this ridiculous pipe dream, which is the Green Deal. So the Democrat Party is beholden to her. And what's the ramifications of that? Well, the ramifications in this moment, and it's not just her, she did have some buddies that were working on this with her, <laughs> is that yeah. state senators, very powerful, True. obviously, um, that we are divided on this issue. And I think the most important reactions that I've seen are from the people who run affordable housing projects in New York, for instance, the NYCHA Housing Board. Uh, you had Congressman Gregory Meeks, who came out against this, Carolyn Maloney, people who have long represented people in this city who were saying, we wanted this. We needed this. And you're right, over 200 cities competed, and we won because of this. And I've always had difficulty with the argument that if you're running against the system, you have to do everything outside of it. And Hillary Clinton got a lot of flack for running within the system, saying, I can, be, I can change things if I'm inside of it. And what's going on with the progressive movement is they're saying, you can't, you know, you can't take any corporate money, Blow you can't all. work with big companies. Mm. And the truth is, is you... We do need change, but you need to be able to do that from the inside. And getting Amazon here is a way to not only create jobs, but to start a more productive it's national late. conversation mm -hmm. about how to change the it's way that corporates... Right. Yeah, it's an interesting argument. All right. Republicans say they want answers from Andrew McCabe after the former acting FBI director reportedly said in a bombshell interview that DOJ officials talked about possibly using the 25th Amendment to remove President Trump from office. But McCabe now pushing back, saying his comments were taken out of context. The very latest on that next. What actual evidence did you have that the Trump campaign was colluding with Russians? You had none. They had zero. They conspired early on in 2016 to open a counterintelligence investigation into a political campaign. was there that they were actually forming to go into to really to really do big destruction and I put out a statement that you better not do it and in all fairness to Russia and Iran and Syria they didn't attack 
or they're doing it surgically, at least. Saves a lot of people. We do a lot of good work. This administration does a tremendous job, and we don't get credit for it. But I think the people understand what we do. So Prime Minister Abe gave me, I mean, it's the most beautiful five-letter, five-page letter. Nobel Prize, he sent it to them. You know why? Because he had rocket ships and he had missiles flying over Japan. And they had alarms going off, you know that. Now all of a sudden they feel good, they feel safe. I did that. And it was a very tough dialogue at the beginning. Fire and fury, total annihilation. My button is bigger than yours and my button works. Remember that? You don't remember that. And people said, Trump is crazy. And you know what it ended up being? A very good relationship. I like him a lot, and he likes me a lot. Nobody else would have done that. The Obama administration couldn't have done it. Number one, they probably wouldn't have done it. And number two, they didn't have the capability to do it. So I just want to thank everybody. I want to wish our new attorney general great luck and speed and enjoy your life. Bill, good luck. A tremendous reputation. I know you'll do a great job. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening live to the president from the Rose Garden at the White House, officially declaring a national emergency to secure the funding for the border wall. I will sign a national emergency, said the president. We're going to build a lot of wall. We're going to build it one way or another. Now, what follows? We will have continued coverage right here on the Fox News Channel. Keep it here. And, th and thank you to our Fox stations for joining us. We'll have continued coverage live on Fox News Channel. Keep it right here. Signing off from New York, Sandra Smith and Bill Hemmer. And as we continue on cable, 1130 here in New York, we had a clock of about 50 plus minutes for what has been a tour de force for the president selling his policies from China to North Korea to the economy. But critical at this moment is the national emergency you just mentioned, unlock money to go to border security. And he said a lot, um, protecting a lot on behalf of ICE operations. He was happy about that. He mentioned the dollar figure repeatedly. Mm. At one time saying whether it's $8 billion or $2 billion or $1 billion, it's going to build a, wall, a lot of wall. And then ultimately, Sandra, he came back to where a lot of our guests have gone today ultimately a court battle and he referred to the supreme court where he believes he will win he ultimately. ended up taking questions for quite some time there in the rose garden at times some contentious exchanges happening there uh, he was asked about uh, military funding and how this will affect some of that he answered that certain military funds were not allocated yet he said he's spoken to some generals about this and they think that this is the more important move that is how he defended that criticism of this move he talked a lot about the historical nature of national emergencies, of which there were at least 30, I think we detail, that are still in place going back to the days of Jimmy Carter in 1979. The distinction with a lot of those national emergencies that they did not reappropriate money, which is the job of Congress, and that's where the rub comes in now on the legal fight. Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer all already responding. Some of the statements were flying when the president was talking, quote, uh, the Congress will defend our constitutional authorities in the Congress and the courts and in the public using every, every remedy available. I just want to conclude here. The president's emerging declaration, if unchecked, would fundamentally alter the balance of powers inconsistent with our founders' vision. So that's what we're hearing from leading Democrats in Congress. And they finished that statement by saying the president is is not above the law. So lots of criticism there, as expected. Let's bring in Fox News Sunday anchor Chris Wallace. Chris, welcome back. You just heard from the, the president making uh, strongly his case, talking about drugs, human trafficking, gangs flowing across our border. He said, you don't have a border, you don't have a country. We're getting it done, said President Trump. What'd you think? Well, look, he is a strong, forceful advocate for his position. And uh, you heard him challenge, and I thought one of the more powerful moments was when it was suggested, well, you're making up this crisis, and he pointed to the angel moms and dads uh, who have lost loved ones uh, and said, tell them that I'm making this up. So he's, he's making a strong and emotional case, and there are obviously millions of Americans who are going to agree with him. On the other hand, uh, there are people who 
one, question whether or not it's a national emergency, and two, even if they think that it is, say, uh, question the idea of whether this is a constitutional overreach, whether the president has the power to spend money that hasn't been appropriated by Congress. I mean, the big difference between this and the other declarations of emergency, as Bill pointed out, those were specific cases where the president was freezing the funds of somebody, or 9-11, or swine flu. This has been a debate going on in this country about building a wall or not building a wall for years, and Congress, either in its wisdom or lack of wisdom, didn't give him anything more than this $1.375 billion, and he said, no, I want more. Uh, and that makes it very different because he's going over and above and against the express will of Congress. Uh, and that is going to create a, a big fight within Congress, as I had mentioned before, resolution of disapproval. And it's also going to create a big fight in the courts. The other point he made, make America great again, it came repeatedly back to that theme, Chris, and his address on that was that we have not been given the equipment, referring directly to uh, the amount of equipment on the, on the wall to, uh, to get that funding. My sense is, as, as I mentioned probably, what was two hours ago, Sandra, is that <laughs> you can declare a split decision on this in the following sense. A lot of the money he's talking about is readily available. A, a lot of the other will be locked up for some time. But you can continue to process the bill, and that he can sell to those who voted for him on this issue. In that sense, it's a split decision politically. Well, right. And it's a split decision in another sense. He made a very good point when he talked about all the money that was appropriated as part of this congressional deal, forget about a national emergency, for ICE and for Customs and Border Patrol. And as he said a couple of times, it's more money than I know what to do with. It's more money than they had even asked for. So you can certainly declare victory on that and say, well, we didn't get the money we wanted for the wall, but in terms of the personnel, uh, and of course, there have been some Democrats on the left wing who've talked about abolishing ICE. He can say for ICE and for Customs and Border Patrol, I got more money than I even asked for. Hmm. Here, here's um, some of the initial sound from the president on taking action. First one, guys. Today, I'm announcing uh, several critical actions that my administration is taking to confront a problem that we have right here at home. We fight wars that are 6,000 miles away, wars that we should have never been in in many cases, but we don't control our own border. So we're going to confront the national security crisis on our southern border, and we're going to do it one way or the other. We have to do it. Not because it was a campaign promise, which it is. It was one of many, by the way, not my only one. That, Chris, that was the president um, right up at the uh, the beginning of this news conference saying he's going to get this done one way or another. Well, he certainly is going to try, and he certainly is keeping faith with his supporters and saying, I've done everything I can. I've gotten as much money as I could out of Congress, and now I'm going to try to do it through other means. But, you know, he's not the only voice in this, as we have, I've said. Congress is going to have a voice in this, and also the courts are going to have a voice in this. I also wonder about a couple of comments he made and whether his lawyers are going to shake their head. At one point, he said, I could have done it without this money, but I want to do it faster. And I wonder whether that will be used against him, that even the president is saying that I didn't need this money right away, the, the, the whole $8 billion that he's going for. This, this, is going to, this isn't the end of this. I yeah, don't have to tell right. you. This is just the beginning of yeah. all this. Uh, very early chapter. You know, Chris, there's a saying on Wall Street, always be closing, right? You want to have a meeting. You want to work toward the end game in your meeting to try and get the deal. He strikes me as a man who is always be selling. And if you think about the opening remarks about China and North Korea and the economy and on and on, he listed. And he loves the verbal sparring with reporters there. And, and as you rightly point out, having these angel moms turn around and hold up the pictures of their dead children is a powerful moment. But he is always on offense when it comes to his ideas. And again, we saw it again today. Quick last comment on that that we're going to roll. Well, absolutely. And, you know, it was interesting. I, I kind of wondered, you're declaring a national emergency. Why do you talk about these other things? And you're exactly right, because he doesn't know how long the networks are going to stay on and cover it. And he's able to sell his policy on North Korea, his policy on China, his policy on the economy. And oh, by the way, yeah, I'm now I'm going to get to the wall. You're right. He is a master of branding. He's a master at selling. Yeah, on China and Russia, they're helping us with regard to North Korea. I also mentioned South Korea and Japan. That's going to be a big topic for us coming up in about 10 days. Chris, thank you so much. See you on Sunday.
You bet. And we'll have Rush Limbaugh on the show, oh, the King of yeah. Talk Radio, his annual appearance on the show. Good. All right, Chris, thank you so thank much. You Enjoy guys. that. And Bye, thanks guys. for being with us today. Quick break here. A lot more reaction coming up on this. We'll let you know what's going to happen next with Ari Fleischer on deck. Well, you can see that you were unable to make the deal that you had promised in the past and that the deal you're ending up with now from Congress is less than what you could have had no. before a 35-day shutdown. I went through Congress. I made a deal. I got almost $1.4 billion when I wasn't supposed to get $1. Not $1. He's not going to get $1. Well, I got $1.4 billion, but I'm not happy with it. Here now is Dan Kildee, House Chief Deputy Whip and a member of the House Budget Committee. Dan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, you. What did you think? I, I know you heard uh, some or most of all the president's announcement, and he answered a lot of questions there. What happens now? You know, well, we spent the last two months going through a pretty painful process of trying to come to a bipartisan agreement on how we'll fund border security and other aspects of the government. And we did. The president may not like it. There are aspects of it that I don't like. But that does not give the president the authority to essentially ignore Article I of the Constitution and say, okay, I'll take what Congress gives me, but I'm going to reach into the federal bank account and take money that they have not appropriated for purposes that he decides are important. Look, we can have a legitimate debate about border security, but I don't think we can debate whether or not the Constitution is intended to give Congress the right to make appropriations. That is pretty clear. So the um, leadership, uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi uh, of your party, has already put out a statement. Uh, in that statement, they call upon our Republican colleagues to join us to defend the Constitution. They say the president's not above the law. Congress cannot let the president shred the Constitution. Obviously, this is the reaction we are seeing from Democrats in the wake of the president's announcement. How do you want to see things proceed now? Well, I think clearly Democrats are reacting to this, but if we just look at the comments made by some pretty senior Republicans in the last few days, they share this concern. I think we do have to take a look at what the, what the options might be and defend our prerogatives under the Constitution, what form that may take. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Uh, that's going to be a real conversation that'll, that'll go forward. But this is a really clear moment where the president has decided to reach beyond his authority. You know, you know I think Republicans understand that if this precedent is somehow allowed to stand, they should be cautious about what that might mean in the future, where a president who does not get his or her way can simply ignore the law as passed by Congress and by fiat make decisions that are not granted to the president under the Constitution. It's a pretty pretty dangerous moment for you know us. in the spending bill that passed overwhelmingly in congress the house too senate side before that there is a lot in there that republicans like probably a lot in there that democrats would like i think you probably agree on that his I challenge do. however on the legal side saying we'll go to the uh, i think the quote was then we'll be sued and then we will lose and then we will be sued again and then we will be lose and we'll take to the supreme court like the travel ban we will be victorious then do you believe ultimately that is where this is headed congressman I think it's very likely if the president continues down this path. I mean, the courts were designed almost 240 years ago for this very purpose, to resolve disputes over presidential or congressional authority, among many other things that the courts are intended to do. That may have to be where this decision is made. But you, you, you agree that the immigration issue it needs to be addressed, correct? For sure. And, yeah. and I, from the very beginning, have, have been supportive of the efforts to strengthen our border. I think I have maybe some disagreements with the president about how we do that. But I supported the budget agreement, not just because it avoids a shutdown, but I actually support some of those investments that we, we agreed to make on the border. When such, I can't, such as the barriers, et cetera. What, what, what's the issue sticking for you then? Because some of the, on the left are now suggesting perhaps some of the wall that's already constructed should be taken down. You've heard about that, right? Some of that reporting? Yeah, and I, I, my view is to defer to the people with expertise on these matters. And, you know, I understand the president has his view. We have our views. Those views have to be informed by people who really understand border security. Even they may disagree, but I think we ought to really think about what the experts say. And I, and I have heard and heeded some of the concerns by people with really deep expertise that there are parts of our border that clearly will need some barrier, some fencing. But 
I also want to take advantage of the advanced technology that's now available to us and, and fix you're the problem. Some of that. We are. We are. And that's why I think this agreement actually is a good deal. Uh, I support it, not just because we avoid a shutdown, because I think it takes us in the right direction. But I, I have to admit, I'm really concerned, no matter what the issue is, when a president decides that they can actually spend money that Congress has not appropriated for them. That's, a, that's unprecedented in some ways, and I think it's really a, a moment that we ought to stop and pause and really think carefully about. Uh, he, he referenced Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi um, in this statement in the Rose Garden saying that they're playing a, a con game, Congressman. Uh, they said you put up a barrier and that's it. They can't do anything unless they walk left or right and come into the United States.